It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. I'm all alone in the studio. We sent everybody home. It's dark. It's New Year's Eve. And people are on vacation. So here's what we're going to do. A best of episode. Some of the best moments from the year's best episodes. And frankly, most of these were picked by you. So thank you for your contributions. I'm glad you're here. A great Twit ahead. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit. This Week in Tech. Episode 647 for New Year's Eve 2017. The year's best. This Week in Tech is brought to you by GoToWebinar, a trusted webinar platform with over 55,000 customers who've hosted over 2.7 million interactive web events to connect with their audiences. For more, visit GoToWebinar.com slash podcast. Welcome to This Week in Tech. Leo Laporte here all alone in the studio. But don't worry, I won't be alone for long. Everybody makes an appearance in this show practically. Uh, we, we, we started the year, of course, with the inauguration of the new president. And Silicon Valley had eh, kind of mixed reactions, especially to the immigration ban. Watch. I mean, I guess we have to talk about And, you know, I, you know we, I have mixed feelings about talking about politics. We try to keep to politics only where it, the, uh, it intersects with technology. But, in fact, there's a pretty big intersection uh, this is, of course, uh, the uh, concluding of uh, President Trump's first week in office, a lot of executive orders, and one uh, yesterday that uh, seemed to have really triggered a reaction from Silicon Valley. I shouldn't even say that, from all of the tech community, and that's his ban on uh, um, immigrants, visitors from seven nations that are predominantly Muslim uh, but more than that, even green card holders, uh, legal residents of the United States, were blocked at the border. There was some question of whether that was the intent. Apparently, the Border Control called the White House and said, now, do you want us to stop green card holders, too? And they said, you bet. And a number of people were detained. The techs, uh, tech community's reaction to this was uh, of varying strengths. Mark Zuckerberg, one of the first to respond with a somewhat tepid response on uh, Facebook uh, saying he, he didn't think it was a good idea, but um, not really calling it out. On the other hand, Sergey Brin, one of the founders of Google, immediately went to San Francisco International Airport to join the protests there. Uh, and then and there, there's uh, Sergey. He, of course, is also an immigrant uh, from the Soviet Union, Phil. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, so... <sighs> Why Why is Silicon Valley upset about this? You know, to be honest with you, I'm not sure that a um, the tech community has been is doing much good on this issue. Um, they may or, actually be causing more problems. Yeah, or even kind of in the election in general. I think we are a little bit tone deaf about uh, exactly who cares about what we think and who doesn't. I think we well, there's becoming like Hollywood in this it, sense. It's yeah, good point, but it's reasonable for Google, for instance, that has nearly 200 employees that are blocked by this order. Of course, people were try, you know, if they were overseas, would not be able to come back to Google. Sure, uh, many Google employees uh, said, since uh, the, our colleagues can't travel, we are not going to travel anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, Google issued a statement saying we're concerned about the impact of this order and any proposals that could impose restrictions on Googlers and their families or that could create barriers to bringing great talent to the U.S. We continue to make our views on these issues known to leaders in Washington and elsewhere. It does sound like they're not condemning the order. They're more just saying, hey, this inf impacts our business, so we're not happy about it. Yeah, that. and of course, every company has a responsibility to its to its employees and to make sure that, uh, that everyone's okay and that business doesn't get uh, interrupted. And the much larger question is I think we do have some some moral responsibilities to to refugees, to immigrants. Um, but I, I do think the discussion on both sides here has been pretty poor and not, yeah. not helpful. There's very few reasonable voices here. When uh, the tech leaders, include, and Tim Cook, by the way, is in Washington right now, the CEO of Apple. He had dinner with Ivana, Ivanka Trump and her husband, Jared Kushner, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Trump's advisor on Thursday has been going around making the rounds. Cook issued a statement, said, I've heard from many of you who are deeply concerned about the executive order issued yesterday restricting immigration from seven Muslim-majority countries. I share your concerns. It is not a policy we support. That was probably the strongest kind of uh, statement of uh, from all the CEOs. Um, 
But Tim Cook went and sat down along with Elon Musk. In fact, Musk's now met twice. He met again mm -hmm. this week with yep. President Trump. Do you agree, having been in a position like this, do you agree with them that it's important to meet with the incoming president? Yeah, absolutely. I don't, I don't see... Uh, Why wouldn't you? Yeah, I don't see what's to be gained by um, kind of shouting about everything. Right. Um, I think it's just going to make the world worse. So there, there, are, there should be reasonable people on both sides. Uh, it's sometimes hard to do that. There's a lot of pressure to, uh, to, to, to take a, a strong position. There's a lot of pressure to be very vocal. It's good that a lot of people are doing that, but I think we also need uh, people who are actually trying to be reasonable and move the world forward. Right, but when you're when when you're championing <laughs> yourself as a as a beacon of hope and and light and basically you know constantly claiming that you're guiding the United States to this uh, to this you know new frontier of, of greatness through technology, right. I think that you owe it to the the people that you've promised, both American citizens but also your employees, to take a stand against some of this stuff because. I mean, you know, I won't say that every single thing that Donald Trump is is doing is wrong, but there are certainly some measures that can be um, just described accurately as xenophobic and uh, and problematic when it comes to sourcing talent from other countries and basically creating this, you know, this new and open world that all of these Silicon Valley companies are constantly talking about. So uh, I it was actually really disappointed by uh, the 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 number of leaders that were willing to speak out and and the amount of time that it took them to to actually say something. You know, there are people like Sheryl Sandberg who have uh, who have spent years um, talking about progressive ideals and uh, and then when push comes to shove, uh, have have actually been, you know, pretty quiet about these things. She so, did finally um, uh, issue a statement about uh, not about the immigration uh, thing, but about uh uh, the women's mar or no i think planned parenthood the women's march she said that's uh, right yeah yeah um so but you're right she hasn't said a lot and but like, I, th I think as a as a a c level executive at a publicly held company there is some responsibility to not get pol to not be political not to be uh, to become a meryl streep but to in fact to be yeah. more judicious is that right so look i have um i have personal opinions on all this stuff and i'm actually totally happy talking about them yeah not but that's separate. At all. Totally happy talking about them. Yeah. Uh, what I'm, what I also trying to be mindful of is what's actually going to be the most effective way for the world to move in the direction that I would like it to move. Right. And very often that's not uh, telling people from a position of assumed authority what they should think and how they should think. So how not, would you go about it? Well, for example, it's not clear to me that Sheryl Sandberg, like being louder and faster about her position, right. actually helps Help convince it. the people yeah. that need right. to be convinced to change the position. Right. Like it maybe makes people feel better. It maybe makes for better demonstrations. I'm not sure that it actually makes the world, it pushes the world further in the direction that Sheryl would want it to be pushed. There's out. also a significant risk, I think, uh, of silica. At some point, people realizing that the problem isn't so much uh, immigration. Mm -hmm. Uh, the problem is more created by Silicon Valley and automation and that, in fact, the tech community could quickly become the enemy here. Could we, they not? We are pretty tone deaf as an industry, I think. I think we are like, we, we really, we got used to being treated as heroes uh, and kind of the people that are making the world for the past decade or so. And I think that's on the verge of changing. I think we're kind of tone deaf about how we talk about it. I think like yeah, Hollywood I mean, so, so, tripped over that ahead, line so, a I while ago. Hollywood's given up. Hollywood doesn't care. Hollywood's yeah. Hollywood, and, uh, and, and I think most people close, in California feel the same way. And we're close <laughs> to following that. <laughs> right. And the tech industry could be going over that line. I would like us not to. I'd like us to remain effective, and I think that a little bit I, too I mean, much I think shouting that, but, hurts that. What, what, what I've learned over the past week is that Silicon Valley continues to exist in a bubble that is essentially unrelatable uh, for, for a large majority of Americans, right? You know, there is a... Uh, there's been a, di a diversity problem in Silicon Valley for years that that is basically underreported and and under discussed. And I think, uh, you know, when you know, I'm not, I don't want to put all of the blame on on Sheryl Sandberg, but I think, she, you know, she in particular is an easy target because she wants to be or she, um, you know, positioned herself to be considered a leader for uh, for, you know, for the feminist movement and, and, and you know, and, and wrote the book Lean In. Right. And so I think um, when cool. there is such divisive um, rhetoric, uh, you know, that that is that is just constantly coming um, from from Washington, I think that uh, you you kind of have to choose 
you kind of have to choose one way or another. Either you're purely a capitalist and and that's totally fine and you can refrain from saying anything, but then you can't go on to uh, to uh, you know to to expect to be um, treated as as you know as, as an authoritative leader on uh, any progressive movement. So I think you know. The, well, I think Phil, you're saying they shouldn't be a leader in the progressive movement. They should stick to their knitting. Mm -hmm. And do their job. Although I can understand why Sergey Brin, who uh, you know went to that protest, but I think as a private citizen, I don't think he said I'm bearing the banner of Google, but as a private citizen, I feel strongly about this because I'm a I was a refugee. I think you got three different right. issues here that are being conflated. One is the issue of like what should people, how publicly should people state their views, and the answer to right. that is as publicly as they want. Yeah, so everyone can make that decision right. and state them as publicly as they want. Right. The second issue is um, what is the proper role of someone speaking for a company that's a different matter entirely that's a different yeah. matter ent yeah. entirely and then there's a third issue which is what's most effective right and it's that most effective issue where we are about to go over a cliff as an industry where we're about to take everything that we in general think is important and significantly hold those things back by being perceived as hectoring and lecturing and being tone deaf and being out of touch we will make the situation worse if we keep doing so it. can i can i can I say something? I've been real quiet because I'm trying not to do the yelling thing that you well, said because I'm prone I, I, I to do feel that. Like, I feel like we, we are on the edge right now on the precipice of a, a patented O Doctor rant. So okay. as a person who doesn't live in the bubble, I think that you're generally wrong when you say that um, the tech community is tone deaf and that Hollywood is tone deaf. The country in a majority voted an opposite direction of what we currently have as a regime. The popular number of people. Mm -hmm. So that the way the people are speaking and when they speak out, it's not tone deaf in general unless you live in the middle of the country and you've seen your um, job creation go away. As opposed to in Silicon Valley where everything's becoming automated, we're not talking about what educations people need to be having and what we should do for education for people to have these new future jobs. Because until we get the robots to build themselves, build the wall, pay the taxes for it, we've got to do some other things and fix these issues. So. Yes, it's important for a CEO of a major company who has immigrants working for them, mostly as engineers or whatever they have, because you never really see them on a the higher echelon of work and jobs. Well, wait a minute. So, Satya Nadella, Sundar no, no, Pichai. No. I, I, sa I said in general, and don't talk to me like that, because he just made the statement of the fact the way that uh, racially, the way Silicon Valley is, you know how it is in general. I said in general. I didn't say all. Okay. I didn't say every. I said generally. Okay. So, again, let me finish. The way and, things and, are set up. Well, go ahead. Sorry. I'm just saying, I'm just saying that they're not tone deaf. And maybe if we did a little bit better educating the people in the middle of the country about what's about to happen to them, maybe we don't have to fall off a cliff or push ourselves off a cliff or rappel off a cliff. I, I, I agree with you on that. Together that there, about it. There is a leadership role Silicon Valley could take, which is look, the change is coming. We understand this change. You might want to get ready for this. This is the educational. I mean, you push STEM, but this is these are things you've got to do. As a country, we've got to do to prepare ourselves, and it's not—it's not building a wall because that's not going to solve the problem. That's not where the problem's coming from. That's a mistake. Uh, in I saw the, the best thing I saw for that was instead of building a wall, why don't we build a solar panel wall out there in the <laughs> desert and get some free energy? I'm sitting there like, like as the little things like that. I'm like, I like a 12 year old said it, and you're like, that'd be amazing. All right, how many of you bought Snap stock? We had Kevin Rose on yesterday. He said I passed on Snap. Did you pass on Snap? It's unethical for me. To yeah. Yeah, we <laughs> can't. Hyper, we can't. Hyper. Peter, you could. I could. I could, uh, but I passed. Oh. Uh, so I think that. Why uh, you don't believe in millennials? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> I don't see age. Um, the uh, I, I I actually think that it probably will be a little bit like Facebook, where you had this big pop, people got excited, and then it they have a you know slow down and earn earnings or growth doesn't shape up as quickly as possible and then it drops and so maybe I'll buy it when it drops. They're apparently uh, they expect as, as many as a billion dollars I'm sorry. Stop. Stop. I hate I had autoplay video. I thought I had it turned off. Apparently not. Um, apparently there's a, as much as a billion dollars in shorting going on right now in Snap. There's a lot of people betting as you will that yeah. that pop will go away. They, they, uh, they were saying that they were going to and you'll help me with this because you're the financial guy. Sure. Right? Uh, they were they were saying initially that the IPO would be fourteen to sixteen dollars. They ended up mm -hmm. opting for seventeen dollars, yes. mm -hmm. which means they took a lot of money off the table. For the founders, each took three hundred million dollars for yeah, themselves. Quarter billion and three hundred million. Yeah, I forget the final number, but right in there. Right in there, uh, and and uh, in the first day they went from seventeen 
Uh, actually, they started trading at twenty-four dollars a share, which means there was a lot of institutional yeah. and uh, insider trading up front, right before they. Well, went. you set a price. It, it's a big dance on the first day of the IPO because you sell the shares, the underwriters, you fill the book beforehand at right. seventeen dollars a share, and then the opening price is set by kind of a give and take. Uh, it takes place in the NASDAQ. The underwriters, they got special clients. They got people they particularly like. They get let them in on the deal. Yeah, right. You and I are not going to get. We don't a get lot that. of IPO allocation. I wouldn't think. If you did, if you were lucky enough to, 44% uh, pop by the time the day was done, $24.48. Um, and I don't know what it is uh, right now. Share prices went as high as 26 Made a lot of people very rich, including one parochial high school. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, which one was it? In um, Well, the, well this, the story is... In, it was in Los Gatos, right? Yeah, it was a Bay Area high school. Of the course. story is that... Um, St. Francis. Barry Eggers... You may know his name. He's at Lightspeed Ventures. They were one of the early Snap investors. They were He's the a, first? Yeah, they were the first. They made a lot of money, right? They put in they a half. They had a really good 26,000% return. <laughs> <laughs> But Barry spread the wealth because he's a parent at that high school. Yeah. And the high school, which is weird, had an investment fund, a financial growth fund. He's the chairman. And he said, hey, I get you. I can get, I get you a what taste a of that. Silicon Valley thing to do. I get you a taste of that. So get, <laughs> they bought $15,000 in shares, which are worth now. Well, they sold two-thirds of them. They got $24 million. That's a new gymnasium. Did your high school have a fun? Because my public high school had like two pencils. I know. Let alone a I went to fund. a Pentecostal Christian school, so I'm not. If they have, in, if wow. they have endowments, though, they have to invest invest in endowments. So yeah, a lot of private schools have endowments. Yeah. People leave them yeah. money or whatever. It may not be a lot of money. Had an endowment, so. Fifteen thousand, though, is not a huge amount. I would have loved to have invested fifteen thousand and. They well, sold. They didn't even sell all of it. You know to what? Get Hindsight is always twenty twenty on these I things. Know. If you put fifteen grand into Uber or fifteen grand into a lot of things, you'd be, you know. It's true. Alternatively, clinkle, or wash <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the problem. You don't know. Is it a clinkle or is it a snap? You don't know. Yeah. Simon well, Chu is the president now. of uh, St. No, Francis High tell, School. Tell me about it. Said, Barry. <laughs> this is the president of the school. Barry now joins the illustrious list of individuals and families whose foresight and generosity have enriched St. Francis High School. <laughs> So enriched. They should come enrich my student loans. Come enrich me. No. Wow. Uh, New York Times. Is American retail at a historic tipping point? Oh, yeah. And that goes with the zombie shopping mall story, too. Yeah. What's wrong? Sure does. What's wrong with America's retailers? More workers in general merchandise stores have been laid off since October. About 89,000 Americans. More than all of the people employed in the United States coal industry. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's basically the coal industry is Arby's. This yeah. is like this is like retail. Yeah, this is this particular sector of the economy, which is huge, going down the toilet. Uh, one one analyst said it's, e the change is coming at you so fast it feel like it feels like it's accelerating. The transformations hollowing out suburban shopping malls, bankrupting longtime brands, and leading to staggering job losses. Wait, what's the zombie shopping mall? Well, they, they did a it's it's like photos and another story that's related to this. It's probably linked from it. Um, that is, it's the same idea is that there are certain malls that have recast themselves and they've gone higher end yeah. and they've been There's successful. There's a reason to go. But there are a lot of them that are just falling apart because, you know, their anchor stores are well, you lose the anchor. You lose, yeah. And those are not drawing people in. And it turns out that so many people are preferring to shop at big box stores or on the internet that the traditional shopping mall is now a lot less appealing. And so some of right. them can redefine Macy's themselves. Macy's is closing like 100 stores but a lot of them can't and and like sears and kmart which sears owns kmart that that is a company that may not make it at all they may just go out of business and so they, they what do you do with that space and how do you uh turn it into something oh, yeah, else the story is good too is is yeah, this zombie uh, this is this is amazon a, a lot of it you know and there are other trends too like you and know, amazon Walmart is hiring and, like didn't they just announce they're gonna hire like yeah tens of yeah and of by people? the way the worst jobs ever you're working in <laughs> These very that is an issue. Yeah, difficult yeah. conditions. With robots that will eventually replace you there. Too. And eventually you'll have pick and pull robots. But don't, I don't know. I'm a, I, I feel bad, but I'm happier buying my stuff on Amazon Prime than going to the mall. Me too. Do you buy clothes on, the, on Amazon? Yeah. Do you buy shoes on Amazon? Yeah, I just did. See, that, th those are the reasons people would go somewhere is to try something on, yeah. to see how it looks in person. I still do that to a certain degree. Like they have I'll, a terrible I'll, shopping interface, though, for stuff like clothes. Yeah, so I'll get, I'll get a pair of shoes at some point at a local store, and I'll pay a lot for them. 
But when I want to refill, when I want that shoe again, mm -hmm. if I can get it on Amazon, I'll just get it again because I know it fits and I know that I like it. Yeah. So it tends to be like the first purchase is at a at a store. But then if I want 10 more down the road, they don't get my sale because, you know, I paid them for their marked up first version. But then in the end, it's just so much more convenient to say, you know, it's six months later and I want another one of these. I'm just going to yeah, have I mean, it I'm in my in sister's box. wedding in a couple months and I bought three pairs of shoes on Amazon last week. And Partly because it's easy to return, too. right? You, yeah. You, you, you buy as many as you want to look at. You look at them at home. You don't have to look at them in the store. Uh, they talk about a Burlington shopping mall, which used to have 100 stores, now has 20. Yeah. 20 tenants. Uh, last Wednesday, a woman came to the mall looking for shoes, but left frustrated because the Payless store had just shuttered. Right. Two years ago, the mall's owners announced a $230 million renovation, but the plans have stalled. You know, I mean, I can't say I'm sad that malls are going out of business because, you know, but I'm sad about all the lost jobs and the lost sense of community. Pretty soon, nobody's going to even leave the house anymore. Right? What, why, why would you need to? You've got a robot bringing you food. Right. Drones are bringing all your groceries to you. The, um, by the way, I, I, on Twitter yesterday, I asked about um, what you'd find at the zombie shopping mall. <laughs> so, um, well, forever guess. dead at 21. <laughs> victim on a stick. <laughs> Aber crumbling and Fitch was from my friend Phil. Uh, coffin and barrel. That's a good one. <laughs> Um, I love this. The, there, there are a lot of Sax Fifth Circle of Hell was a good one. Um, Skinabon from Cable Sasser. I like that one. And of course, um, the Microsoft Store. Anyway. <laughs> oh! Ow! Zing! The last, one has, Zing. the last one has to be a real one, it right? It has, yeah, has to be. That's the joke right there. It could be Nordstrom if you prefer. Wow! But yeah, Zombie Shop. It is scary, right? This is when we talk about like the future of work being yeah. impacted by uh, automating things. Before we even get to that, we're going to have the future of these whole sectors like retail, where just the convenience is, of online yeah, shopping. It's happening. This is and, not the future. And where there is retail success, it is at Walmarts and Costco's and other kind of like big box stores, Targets, that are not the mall where where it's like trying to replicate the old downtown of a city where there are 50 different shops. Now, yeah. That's also kind of peeling away. I love this uh, this story. I'm going to jump all over today because you guys are you guys are playful, so we can have some fun. Uh, the Dark Overlord, the Dark Overlord, has apparently hacked the production company that had Orange Is the New Black and a bunch of shows from ABC, Fox, National Geographic, and IFC, and they tried to blackmail Netflix. <laughs> they said, we have the next season of Orange is the New Black, which comes out in June. Uh, they, and if you don't pay us, we're going to put it on the torrents. Well, Netflix just laughed at them. So they put it on the torrents on yesterday. Netflix was like, <laughs> Netflix was like we make deal. house of cards, dumb dumb. We yeah. know how blackmail works. Well, you can't uh, do this. Yeah, right. Orange is the New Black, according to Netflix, is their most popular uh, Netflix original. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Great. Uh, they're very, they're very, uh, they're very cagey about giving out numbers for each of their individual shows. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, that is actually mm -hmm. a, a real key piece of information for the industry. According, this is yeah. according to Variety, um, the, the studio is a, a ADR, which is what something dialogue recording, additional dialogue recording. Larson Studios, they got mm -hmm. hacked in the fall. That oh. and uh, but the the hacker doesn't have the whole season, just have the first ten episodes. <laughs> so Netflix is going, yeah, go. That's great. It's a great promo. You still have to subscribe to Netflix to find out what happens. Oh, you're not going to get that season finale. You got to subscribe. Yeah. Find out. These hackers yeah. have really good taste because uh, I feel like Orange is the New Black doesn't get as much uh, talk or as much as like House of Cards or something. <laughs> yeah, so no, you're really right. Good. It's like it's less. Great. That's this is a good hype man. It's this a great a series. Hype. I bet I you it's an inside job. It. What a great marketing campaign by Netflix. So now you're telling me that Dark Overlord is actually a Netflix employee trying to beat up. Uh, well, first I mean, of all. It's, it's obviously first of Reed all. Hastings, guys. It's obviously Reed Hastings, what? the Dark Overlord. He yeah. probably calls himself that in uh, executive meetings. <laughs> what kind of what kind of hacker names himself the Dark Overlord? I mean, <laughs> a very young one. This very, is for, this is a 14 year old. Definitely. <laughs> definitely a kid. And it and by the Just way, a kid of somebody who works at that ADR house, right? Yeah, like that's that's what we're all it's guessing is dopey. that it's gonna something like that. Yeah, his Twitter uh, handle has a three in it for the in the word hacker. Oh, that's, so that's leet. He's leet. So you know he's really. <laughs> anyway, he's the deadline passed. He posted it, and then he did a press release 
He called it a press <laughs> release. Oh, that's adorable. <laughs> he called it a press. It's so cute. He's so adorable. He called. Uh, let's uh, let's go to the Dark Overlord hacker. Uh, now this isn't it. Uh, I'm trying to find. There's apparently many Dark Overlords on Twitter. There's so many. <laughs> I'm surprised he needed, uh, he didn't, was like the Dark Overlord 46. <laughs> he, uh, oh, this is terrible. Anyway, I'm trying to find the uh, Dark Overlord press release because it's the funniest thing I ever read. Um, let me see if I, if I can find it somewhere. Can you find it, Karsten? Because he, he, he's, he's kind of. Is it, is it the one where he says it didn't have to be this way? It didn't that, have to be one? this way. That was my favorite. He says, uh, he says, it didn't have to be this way, Netflix. Wait, can I can I just make? Would you do, be okay. Dark Overlord for us, Ashley? Esquita? I'll be Dark Overlord, guys. I'll All be right. Dark Overlord. It didn't have to be this way, Netflix. <laughs> You're going to lose a lot of money in all of this than what our modest offer was. We're quite ashamed to breathe the same air as you. Wait a minute, what? Group. We're quite ashamed to breathe the same air as you? So ashamed. <laughs> we figured a pragmatic business such as yourself would see and understand the benefits of cooperating with a reasonable and merciful entity like ourselves. Merciful. <laughs> the, we are the merciful dark overlord. Yeah. And I really love the end where he says, and to the others. There's still time to save yourselves. Our <laughs> offers are still on the table for now. <laughs> oh, so I'll good. tell you what, if it, if uh, it, you know that if I ever do something like this, I am going to be the dark overlord so that attribution just becomes a disaster. Like, if you're going to do this, you do not want people tracking you down. You do not want <laughs> – this is a really good way to obfuscate people tracking you down because they're going to go like, like – Hitting Netflix is going to be like bad news bears. They can come after you, right? There's some smart yeah. people at Netflix. But I'm your dark overlord. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Don't mess with me. That's right. I'm going to get my braces off in six months and then you'll be sorry. <laughs> But please don't arrest me before prom, guys. Okay? <laughs> Didn't we These see this person have... on social media? The person with the raven on the subway? Pretty sure that's the dark overlord. <laughs> I think you're right. The person with the right. live raven. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do oh I need boy. to get my hoodie and put my hoodie on like Mr. Robot? <laughs> yeah. Even Mr. Robot didn't call himself the Dark Overlord. Come on, kid. Come on. Get a, get a handle. Get a good handle. Get a good handle. Dark Overlord. I love that. That's so difficult. You know, I'll tell you right now, like, if I could give you some advice, Dark Overlord, if you're watching, uh, do not hack HBO. Because if you take Game of Thrones, they will they will literally hire Liam Neeson to find you. Right. Like it will very be the plot of Taken, the next Taken movie. Yeah. It will be very serious. Yeah, here's the I found the uh, Dark Overlord, who's apparently a Vincent Van Gogh fan. Oh, uh, big time! He says, yeah, and he and uh, uh, there's no copyright on Vincent Van Gogh. Oh, oh he's very he's, he doesn't want to yeah doesn't want to offend. Sorry. Offend. Open yeah. Yeah. Uh, it wouldn't, amazing. It wouldn't have to. <laughs> Ashley, you do that voice very well. <laughs> you will get to play the Dark Overlord when we make the oh, movie. Oh, my God. In the, yeah. in the motion picture. The in Pirates the of Silicon Valley. The Dark I'm Overlord could be the villain in that I'm movie. It'll be you. great. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. I love Ashley Esketha's <laughs> Dark Overlord. That To me, that may be one of the best uh, of all. And by the way, just to you know, kind of circle round. No, Dark Overlord did not take his or her revenge on Ashley. She she survived unscathed, unescathed. Uh, our show today brought to you by Go to Webinar. We're really pleased. We we were you know we always do these best ofs, but often we don't have advertisers. But Go to Webinar came up to us right at the last moment and said, you know we'd like to buy the best of. So they're sponsoring all the best ofs. Thank you, Go to Webinar. Go to Webinar is great. I've used it. I've made, done a number of go webinars with Go to Webinar. Uh, I'm not alone. They've hosted 2.7 million interactive web events this year. That's uh, 60 million views. That's one of the things that's cool. What is that average then? More than 20 people per webinar, but it can be even bigger. GoToWebinar lets you present from one to six presenters, as many people who can see it as you want, both live and on demand. And that's really, really you get the, you know, all the big audiences is you create a live webinar with live audience, you have polls, 20 polls, up to 20 polls per webinar, up to 20 questions per poll. You can set them up ahead of time. You can do it in the middle of the webinar if you don't, you know, people don't understand or you're worried that people are, you know, you just want to know more about your audience, whatever. You do that during the live webinar. But the live webinar is recorded and the polls are live and the numbers are live on the 
on-demand version. So that's really neat. People can still interact with it, still feel like it's got the excitement of a live event, but you don't have to be there. But you can do this webinar once and, and watch and have millions of people see it after the fact. It can be completely branded with your company's logo and custom image and all the webinar materials. Easy to start, too. You, they have automated mail templates that let you send out custom email invitations and confirmations and reminders. That's really important. Mobile friendly, that's right. You can do this, by the way, on your phone, iOS or Android. And you can not only schedule a webinar, set it up, but you can edit a session and track performance. Speaking of tracking, they have lots of metrics. So it's a great way if you're doing sales presentations to gather leads. If you're teaching to get a sense of how many students attended the whole thing. And actually, that's very helpful in making your webinar better. Were they paying attention? Did they stick around? Uh, so that the next time you even get more engagement. I am a, a fan of GoToWebinar. I want you to try it. Go to webinar.com slash podcast is the special address. That way they know you saw it on our best of episodes. Go to webinar.com slash podcast. Thank you, GoToWebinar, for making this uh, New Year's Eve presentation even a little bit more special. Pop the champagne, folks. Mark Zuckerberg running for president? Imagine yourself a small town, Newton Falls, Ohio. Nothing ever happens exciting. You get a phone call from a company saying a billionaire philanthropist wants to have dinner with you next week. I can't tell you his name. In fact, I won't tell you his name until 15 minutes before he arrives. Would you be willing to? This family said yes. And here's the picture of Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> in meeting real people. The, the, the grandmother to his left looks like, oh, God. Why, why <laughs> you know, anytime you see this picture, you assume she's looking at a smartphone, but there aren't any smartphones in evidence. They're eating on plastic plates because apparently Mark won't eat real people's food, so they had it catered. Uh, oh, is that why? Yeah. Did they really have a, who, did they really have it catered? They had it catered. Oh, my gosh. And uh, Lito, the, the article, I feel, I feel, this is in Business sorry. Insider, said that Mark, uh, Mark's people were tapping away at their laptops in the other room <laughs> like he brings an entourage oh, of course he brings yeah so oh, here's the gosh. thing okay i i really i want to i want to ask the panel here so i wrote a piece i don't know a few months ago saying it sure as heck looks like mark zuckerberg's running for president and there was some people that were like absolutely when you look at all these photos and there were other people like you you're completely wrong the all of these photos, I what is going on? Like, what is he doing? And don't tell me he's just going around the country meeting people because if he was doing that, why would he? Um, he be specifically with a said to this family, "Would you, if when the press calls you, and they will, please tell them I'm not running for president." So yeah, I don't think he's old enough to run for president, is he? Yes. No, so but here's he could be when when he what, in 2020 he she, turns he will 35 be. one month before the filing deadline <laughs> okay. for 2020. I mean, I, I think it's possible. I think it's highly improbable. Um, and, and Really? No, no. Why is yeah. he doing this then? Why is he, I think and he's, then also, he's okay. maybe eventually, eventually doing that. They've got a yeah. massive press problem on their hands right now um, yeah. with fake news. and. Does this make people feel better you know? about fake news to see Mark sitting at this table? <laughs> with catered food? <laughs> I mean, really? Here's, here's, so so I, mean, I, I think you're right, Amy. I think he's not running for in the, this cycle. He's not running in 2020, yeah. unlike yeah. by there he is driving a tractor. Oh, please. Oh, I, please. I, I have to tell you, I feel like I have a special point of view on this because, you know, I'm out there. In fact, right before I got here, I'm out there in Hull, Massachusetts. You're doing you know, Frank this. And I, I'm doing this. And the thought of inviting myself over to someone's house is so deeply uncomfortable. And if you want to meet people, this is a completely wrong, really weird way to go about it. Like I have people that write me every week and, and I go, do you want to have coffee? And that sitting down in private and talking, yeah. it's not making it this weird media thing. And he it's brings, just, it's clear he brings photographers, yeah. lights. Look yeah. at this picture really talking to a fire department. Um, this looks so <laughs> canned, phony, and staged. He doesn't. Yeah. It looks like he's been green screened into this. I okay. The, okay, the better so question the is thing. though: um, is it does you know? So Brianna, you're asking people sure. if they want to have have coffee with you. 
Um, <laughs> wouldn't wouldn't Zuck just tell us we're going to have coffee with him <laughs> through the miracles of AI and machine learning? And like, right. why bother going out into the real world when you have everybody's data at your fingertips? I think you're both right. I think. Can we wait? Wait, hold on. Can we look at this, this other evidence here pointing okay. to a politically a political campaign? So he, they updated their um, uh, S1 filing with the SEC to note that that if Mark right. Zuckerberg decides to run for office and he could still remain CEO. Why would you why would you put that in there if that didn't mean anything? They've been hiring people from the Obama campaign, uh, uh, on the foundation. Um, there's just all of these things that he's been doing. And these photos, it it doesn't add up. It's it, you know, there's yeah. people that have been telling me telling me, oh well it's just a PR push. And but it's it's giving them more negative PR around this whole president thing. If the goal what the is hell to does he to, want to be president for, though? I mean, honestly. Well, I, so I, it, I have a theory. I don't know if it's yeah. president because I do think that it's too small of a job for him. I yeah. wonder. He wants if, to be emperor of the world. He wants to What's be bigger of the world? than president of the United States? <laughs> no, maybe he maybe he's going to try out for like governor or even mayor. Yeah. Or I don't know yeah. something no. to kind of you know as a testing but, ground. But there's something going on. It's not there's just clearly something going on. I think Amy, on. you're right. What, there, there is a question. He he. In fact, we many of our panelists have said this in the past. He's already got a very uh, probably the he's a king maker. He doesn't need to be the yeah. king. Always better to be the king maker, yeah. the Richelieu rather than you know because then you have more power. Frankly, the king maker. However. So I don't think he's running in 2020. I think though that this is a he's playing the long game that at oh, some yeah. point he would look at this. You that's don't do it. that. A, you don't yeah. Because of fake news, you don't feed a cow. <laughs> <laughs> and these I don't know. I I I, I got to say I cuz I'm, you know, um we we advise many 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 news organizations and also not this administration, but the previous administration. And he's got a pretty massive problem on his hands. Um, oh, and if every news organization in the country, in our country, decided to cut off the tap, um, that would be a tremendous problem. Well, they're, and they're doing it, right? So, Instant but, Articles but, right. Is, so, has lost the New York Times. They've lost the Washington Post. But, so okay. I... I there, there may be part of this, maybe politics, but I also think that there's a piece of this that's but, that's but, a PR. Mistake. Amy, how does this help I, you know, fake news or instant articles? I don't understand how this question. helps anything. Can so you if imagine? I were to connect the dots, yeah. Uh, no, I don't. I don't think that it. Uh, this is your job, Amy. This is what another. you do. You you yeah. you're predicting the future for, for us. So here's here's the here's the thing. I, you know. My, my hunch here is that we're all so easily distracted, no matter how smart we are and how, you know, prestigious our jobs might be, we get distracted over and over again. And I, my first career was as a journalist, so this is not about me, you know, disliking journalists or anything like that. I, I just think we get distracted. And I think that um, that that campaign, if, you know, whether it was for politics or for straight up you know, ingratiating Zuck and Facebook, uh, Facebook back into everybody's good graces, I think was more about, um, was a lot about likability. And yeah. uh, I, I think that that has a reverberating effect. I really do. I think it, you have to look at the big picture here too. I mean, look at, he recently gave away a huge portion of his wealth for, you know, philanthropy worldwide. And, well, you know, a lot of the work well, I know it's sort a little quirky of gave I know it it's away. quirky. I know it's quirky. But I mean, my point there is he's trying to you know, raise an international presence here. And when he has a positive view by the mass public, I think it enables him to you know, do a lot of things. Like if Facebook is trying to you know, work with local governments, that's a huge part of what they end up doing. So I, I see this as a an overall political move meant to open many doors for him. And maybe he runs for uh, president, maybe he doesn't. But it certainly makes a lot of the things Facebook wants to do just easier. So uh, I would mention to Mark's team that uh, just remember Mike Dukakis in the tank with the helmet. That picture with basketball players does not <laughs> show it again. Does not raise yeah. Zuck's stature. That's <laughs> no. that is probably the one you want to throw out. Just um, I'm just saying. Also, I think here's the thing. Let's just pretend that the four of us run Mark's public relations team. Can you imagine? So it, you know. Oh, guys, there's been this huge problem with fake news. What do we do? And someone says, I know. Let's go take a picture of Mark feeding a cow. <laughs> well, remember that. <laughs> Mark and wait a minute. But wait, Nick. <laughs> but how, how many different places did we all see that photo? I completely agree with you. But yeah, it um, worked in that respect. But I, 
That's right. That's right. So he did, you know, Mark does, as we know, uh, these things. Like he was going to uh, only uh, cook and kill his own. He was only going to eat meat he killed. Meat. Yep. Uh, he was going to learn Chinese and actually did, which is kind of impressive. Having tried that for myself for four years <coughs> in school, it's not easy. Uh, so one of his goals for this year was to go to all 50 states, talk to people in all 50 states. So you could just say on the surface that he's just doing his weird kind of i'm a billionaire i could do anything i want so instead of building a rocket ship i'm gonna meet everybody in every i state. don't know I, I didn't see photos of him like studying conj or whatever i didn't exactly. getting verbs exactly. he, right like sitting sitting <laughs> how uh, yeah. how did you see, how, did you see photos of him killing his animals no, no. so why are we seeing photos of this stuff this well, it's P okay so we all agree it's pr Oh yeah. uh, yes! Oh look at oh, meeting yeah. generals now. That's important. You gotta you gotta meet uh, generals if you're gonna. Is that an American <laughs> general? Where? It, <laughs> what uniform is that? I've never seen that hat before. What is that? So here's the I like other thing. I, I I do, do want to say one other thing. So there was when 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 I written that that Vanity Fair piece, BuzzFeed went along to um uh, to Zuck. They got access to him and they said, "Are you running for president?" And he said, "No." And then there was this big story like. Zuck says he's not running for president. Of course he's not going to say he's running for president. It's the, 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 Facebook stock would literally drop 20, 30 percent right. in five seconds. Right. So yeah. so it's it, you know, I think that there's we should we should not take it as face value when he says no or don't tell people I'm running for president. There is something going on and we should we should be questioning it. So what do you want to start? You want to start with Google? Google I.O.? Well, Google I.O. was kind of the it should have been the biggest news of the week. And it wasn't. And it really kind of, I think a lot of, let a lot of people down. There's actually a lot of significant stuff. It just, they didn't really explain why the stuff mattered that good. Well, and much right? of the stuff wasn't available yet. Well, that's part of Google's, always Google's problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Gizmodo piece by Michael Nunez is, was, was the best that said that you just can't see that. It's, it's neater stuff, but you can't see it. You can't touch it. Well, I'm, and, and, you know, in, in Google's defense, that's a good point. I mean, uh, if, you know, you making if, if you're making big strides in artificial intelligence, well, that just kind of slips away. If that's one of the things Sundar Pichai said, he says, we're moving from a mobile first world. By the way, I'm just catching up with mobile first. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of companies are. We're moving from a mobile first world uh, to a AI first world. And that's kind of that's kind of interesting. Um, and, and well, that was kind of the sell last year for Google I/O. I, think, I thought they said the same thing. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I, I, you know, yeah. one of the things that sticks out to me is if you look at the complaints before Sundar took over as CEO about a year ago now, um, a lot of it was that you go to Google I/O and you see all these like really fun G whiz kind of ideas that aren't necessarily fully realized that are costing a lot of money. Sundar came in as CEO and kind of focused the company, got rid of a lot of that sort of thing. And this is really what the company's focused on. And so this is iterative stuff versus last year in this AI yep. first idea. And there, and there, it's good progress. Like the cloud TPU uh, set up these is basically these computer chips that will help their machine learning system. Tensor grow, processing units. Yeah, That's grow probably faster. the biggest news of the event. Right? This I mean, is exactly. It has yeah. huge business implications. Fascinating. So, so, there, so these, are, these are inexpensive, almost, they look like almost like Raspberry Pis. They got four processors on them, big heavy duty GPU stuff. This is no Raspberry Pi, 180 yeah. teraflops. Yeah. And so this could give them an advantage in their cloud services versus Amazon. This could give them an advantage in building out their AI. They're also making it available to third parties so as part yeah. of the, yeah. the yeah. Google yeah. Compute yeah. Cloud. Build AI uh, software. I think so they've already open sourced TensorFlow, the software, yep. and these are hardware devices designed to run yeah. TensorFlow at speed. And if you, you know, you're know you impressed with 180 teraflops, that's really not the point because the idea is they massively paralyze, parallelize them. Yeah. And these these racks are multi petaflops per. This is eleven point five petaflops of machine learning in this rack. And so, what I think the missing piece really was Sundar or somebody else from Google saying, "Hey, this is what the this is the here are the cool things we'll be able to build with." this technology. Here's the stuff that you developers should come and help us build together. Regular people watching this, consumers and, and enthusiasts, here's what the future is going to look like. And and here's the vision, right? So they, it's, Sundar's Google doesn't do as good of a job at illustrating that vision in these keynotes. 
as uh, as as you know. Let's face it. Tech journalists would wa rather have Sergey Brin uh, parachuting in with Google goggles on, even though he that was on a better show. It's sure. a better show, well, but it's it's equally show. meaningless. Exactly. Ex well, yeah. not even equally. <laughs> Maybe much, more so. <laughs> much more meaningless. Yeah, yeah right? genuinely meaningless. Yeah. So it's 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 less exciting, but this is probably one of the most significant things Google's announced. And I think I think that's really right. It, it it's enabling. Right. It, 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 you don't know, remember the, the name of that guy uh, we talked about on the show for like an hour once was a Swiss or an Austrian AI genius. Yeah. yeah I can't I remember his name. Remember it was a great name. name. Either. Yeah. Jurgen somebody. Yeah. But but he talked about how the theory is so far ahead of the practice because of exactly what you just said, Nate, is that the, is that the power to do what they want to do isn't there. So, yeah. so their theory is way ahead. And this. Oh, this Jürgen Schmidhuber. You're talking about Jürgen Schmidhuber. Jürgen Schmidhuber. Yes. Oh, yeah. Not the best website I've ever seen. <laughs> See, I can't tell if this is like he hasn't updated his website since like 1996 or if it's like since an ironic, like I want machines. it to look this way, like in kind of like a hipster. <laughs> oh, click on what's new. Yeah. yeah. What's new? 12 May 2017. But I, I've also Good. probably zoomed this in. That's what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> well, that's much, much better. I'm going to zoom back in because I can't read it that size. Um, hmm. But yeah, I mean, you know, like here's this opportunity S sell us on the future. Like, tell us where this is all going and why building this together with you is so much better than putting your energies as a developer or maybe, your dollars as a consumer towards this, Amazon. Maybe towards not. Facebook maybe the that. smartest thing would for them just to shut up. But see that this is this is what Google doesn't do. Google doesn't shut up. They Apple build their shuts products up in, exactly. Google builds their products in front of you. Sometimes they fail. Uh, but they always are basically, you get to see how the sausage is made. Apple, they, they keep it secret. And then when they have a fully realized product, usually, unless it's like a beta like Siri or, or Apple Maps, then they'll bring it out to you. Um, this is actually something that Mark and I have been talking about recently, uh, just just as friends, but also on our Buzzkill podcast. But it's like, this is this Good is plug. a difference between those <laughs> companies. Yeah, uh, Facebook, Where's my plug buzzer? Yeah, Facebook also, <laughs> you know, with their F8 developers conference, they're they're further behind on all this tech, but they showed some like you know cute yeah. camera apps, and it got people excited. I kind of respect a company like Google where they're not going to do the flash; they're just going to do the. And remember, it's a developers conference, and they're not going to yes. try to impress. Well, it's a developers conference, but these keynotes have been so filled with consumer news that yeah. the expectation these days is that you're going to have something flashy to show. I was off. a little disappointed we didn't see anything about Chromebook. We didn't see anything about a lot of consumer products. They didn't mention the yeah. Pixel phones. They didn't. Uh, mention, they did mention Google Home and the Assistant, and the Assistant now is on the iPhone, mm -hmm. uh, which is really a stealth introduction to Assistant to get iPhone users to understand, you know, that Siri you've got, that's crap. This is what a real Assistant can do. I think hoping to woo some people over to Android, but at least to get them to buy the Google Home. The other thing that, maybe it's just me, I keep mentioning this, and everybody's kind of ho-hum. I think the fact that you can make free calls to the any phone in the u.s and canada on your google home is kind of impressive i think that amazes people our age maybe it's because we're old <laughs> yeah yeah as we we're saying we we're saying we we're there you know we, we're old enough uh, fellow panelists we're old enough that our parents would yell at us to get off the phone yeah because it's long distance it's costing a lot of money Right. Yeah, see, to me, that's not impressive at all because your cell phone does that yeah and you have unlimited minutes now exactly <laughs> it's like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's it, it Plus, they don't want to talk on the phone. Nobody right? wants to talk on the phone. Yeah. If, if I have to go to my phone to set up my speaker, my speaker should know that my phone exists, and it should be able to basically be a speakerphone. Like that doesn't seem. Crazy. I just Amazon, you millennials you know, don't Alexa, take. You can call all the other Alexas. You can only call other Echoes. Yeah. This so in a couple of ways they scooped. I thought they sort of, you know, scooped Amazon's big announcements in the last few weeks because that was one announcement is free Echo to Echo calling. Big deal. Yep. And they also have, by the way, some privacy issues because there's no way to block calls. So the fact that anybody who figures out how to get a hold of you on your Echo can bug the hell out of you in your house yeah, no is thanks. a problem. No thanks. But then remember, Amazon has announced but not yet shipped this uh, home. The sh what do they call it? The show? Uh, yeah, the show. The show has a screen on it. It's really just a tablet with an Echo built into it. But Google says, well, we didn't do that because you got screens all over the house. So how about... If you just can cast your calendar or your or your to your TV, your, to yeah. your TV or any other you know cast ready screen in your house, yeah. and of course most people have cast ready screens all over the place now. Yeah. So I thought that was that was impressive. It does make me wonder though if 
and this is something that Megan Maroney brought up actually, um, and we were talking about it earlier, is is whether or not this puts pressure on Amazon to come out with a phone again. Because even, so, you know, Google has its apps on the iPhone and they of course have Android, but basically if you're using an iOS device or an Android device, they have a presence on your phone. And the reason why this might be a little bit of a jump ahead for them in this in the smart speaker phone calling thing is because they, they have access to your phone in ways that Amazon doesn't yet. Well, I, and that's the other thing Google has to kind of think about is the creepy line, right, Jeff? I mean, uh, every time they announce mm -hmm. something, there are going to be a, a group of people, privacy advocates, to say, oh, hell no. Yeah. I don't know, put yeah, that especially in, in Europe. House. Yeah. Right. Uh, the Google Lens is kind of funny. They announced uh, uh, this is uh, an AI capability that reminds you a lot of Google Goggles which and which Amazon's Fire Phone. Seven years ago. Right. Um, but I asked somebody at Google uh, who was involved in integrating this into uh, search and photos. She said, well, but this is AI. You know, Goggles was kind of pre-populated. We had to teach it. This is, this is learning all the time. So, for instance, I love this. They took take a picture of a flower. This happens to me all the time. What is that flower? And it, it will actually say, oh, that's a milk and wine lily. And it will even give you nearby florists. You can order it and buy it. That is cool. That's a business proposition for Google, but I think yeah. that's cool. If you have barcodes on the back of your router, it will automatically configure, you know, connect to it by just taking a picture of it. It can read it. And my favorite one was they showed, you know, you using your phone. And I'm not sure what app this is. Maybe it's just the camera app because that has lens built into it. You turn on lens and then you point at different storefronts and it'll tell you what the star rating is, you know, how much it costs. You can make a reservation. How many? So this is this is AR beyond what, what Facebook can do because Google has all that data. Well, and, it, you know, I know Apple at some point Apple's going to announce AR. This seems to me exactly what Apple might announce in the fall. And I think they've scooped them a little bit. Here's, a, here's the, an example of... They took a picture of a marquee at one of my favorite clubs in San Francisco, Bimbo's 365 Club. Of the Stone Foxes are playing May 17th. So the lens is smart enough to know that that's a Stone Foxes, offers you Stone Foxes music, offers to add that to your calendar, nice. which is pretty impressive, and shows you where you can buy tickets to that, all from taking a picture of the marquee. Those things seem like the kinds of things that would be useful over and above what goggles could It's be. an entirely new uh, uh, user interface with the computer. They, they, they had typing, and they have conversation, and now they have sight. Can we get into some Amazon topics? I've been waiting to fight our episode sure. with Tom, well, and it hasn't come up yet. This so is the one I wanted to bring up, because something. while I'm in this news drought in South America, I read another story that Amazon bought Whole Foods for $13.7 billion, and again, I thought, what? And I couldn't wait to get back here and, and ask you all what you think of this. Amazon buys Whole Foods. Now, th there's some wags who said, I don't think this is how markets work, but who said, you know, Amazon stock went up by more than $13.7 billion. So in effect, it was free. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't a yeah, stock no, deal, though. It so yeah. It's not really how it works, but not, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but it certainly was a good move, at least from the point of view of the market. They thought, Hey, this is a good acquisition. Is it? Why would Amazon buy a brick and mortar grocery store? Yeah, Who wants to start? One had some struggles. Actually, I'll let uh, you know. Yeah. Um, let Tom Merrick, because uh, uh, apparently Owen J.J. Yeah, well, no, Stone I, thinks I, they're I, going to have a fight. I wanted Owen to go first so I could just take the opposite of whatever he says. Oh, that's yeah, Owen's okay. technique. Oh, man, oh, a little jujitsu. That, that is my technique. <laughs> that is it. That, see, Tom, this is why I don't like Tom. Tom, <laughs> Tom is, I'm trying to get Tom out of here. Tom, no. But look. <laughs> This was the greatest deal known to man. Are you crazy? Do you know how awesome this is? Okay. First Why all, is this a good deal? Let's hear it. First of all, uh, Whole Foods, a.k.a. Whole Paychecks, has done the marketing research, and they only are in rich environments. Those people are the people that can afford to pay Amazon to deliver and or pick up and or drop off their expensive groceries because regular people won't do it. So taking an Acme or a ShopRite or a Lion or whoever – Grocery stores are going to help you. This is a national food uh, grocery store. So get Coast to Coast, Key West to Key Largo. Uh, uh, there's a Ooh, bunch like of that. benefits Key West to, to Key Largo, that's both in the same state. It's a, it's a, <laughs> yeah. Don't Go listen to what I'm saying. It's 
sounds I'm good, saying. though. <laughs> question what I'm saying. Just listen to what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Anyway, <laughs> it's it's great for them because they have many markets in certain areas that are affluent areas to test their whole pantry system and and food it's that like they're trying to sell. Key West to Key Largo is like ten miles. That's why like are you? Stuck? <laughs> I said thirty two things in five seconds. And you stuck on Key West to Key Largo. Shut up and listen. It sounds good, though. I like it. Go ahead. This is a smart dinosaur. <laughs> Most companies, Blockbuster sat there and watched Redbox eat their lunch. They watched Netflix yep. eat their lunch, and they didn't do anything. Amazon is the end-all, be-all of retail selling, and this is a strong foothold coast-to-coast, -coast, San Francisco to Miami, that's going to help them expand their, their grocery brand that they are obviously moving forward to. They're probably going to scale back on the high-priced items, but it's a great move for them, and it gives them a foothold in something that they bought, quote-unquote, on the cheap. They, quote-unquote, got for free. It's great. It wasn't that cheap. I mean, th that's the by far the largest acquisition. The bi next biggest like one is like Zappos for $2 billion. It's expensive to me. It's cheap to you, Uncle Leo. It ain't yeah. nothing but well, a thing That's true. You see what, what I'm saying? Jeff Bezos, what does he make? Somebody said he makes like $10 million a day. Uh, so <laughs> I guess he could afford it. Yeah. They had some cash it. on hand, too, a few. so they, yeah, they, they could have, afford it. Yeah. Boy, this I, looks I, good, I, doesn't it? I think this is nice. I don't I disagree I with anything that, that, uh, that Owen is saying. I, the thing that I was saying about Whole Foods was they were their profit margins have been degrading. Uh, they've they've been, been in trouble, yes. a little bit in trouble, been, right? They're not they've been fending yeah. off a little bit of uh, activist investor pressure. Uh, so this was a way for them to make a a an exit to somebody who can absorb that pressure and not worry about it because Amazon runs on thin margins all the time. Amazon just made Amazon fresh, fresh again because they get a presence like. Owen's saying in all of these different markets, and they get brick and mortar Key outlets that they can up. use as distribution <laughs> for that. The problem is Instacart has a five-year deal with Whole Foods. So they're gonna have to figure out what to do to either break that deal or coexist with Instacart delivering Whole Foods for five years. And Instacart's out there immediately saying, Amazon is a threat to every other grocery store. You wanna <laughs> sign up with us right now. <laughs> Yep. Is this, though, I mean, uh, it seems like that, assuming that this is a deal about Amazon delivering groceries to its customers, seems l like it's it's less than it really is. It's, it feels like there's more to this than just that. Oh, more than just that, yeah. yeah. And and I, th I think they obviously want to, to jumpstart the same thing they've been doing with the brick-and-mortar book retail stores and there've been a lot of rumors that they were they were thinking about doing electronics outlets and and they have that Amazon Go convenience store so they may be if they can get the kinks worked out thinking of bringing that kind of technology into the Whole Foods outlets uh, to make them you know super high tech places to shop so yeah i don't think it's just about delivery but that's the big early win for them it's funny Here, because as Ben Thompson as Ben Thompson points out in Stratechery it was only 2 years ago that Whole Foods uh, CEO John Mackey predicted that groceries would be Amazon's Waterloo. <laughs> so if you can't beat them, uh, buy them. Yeah. Yeah. Here's how I think of this deal. And, and Larry Dignan on ZDNet has, you know, my colleague has written really smartly uh, about it. He yeah, watches great. this stuff and he's yeah. pretty skeptical too. Um, he's, he's pretty bullish on it as well. And, and obviously we've talked about it a lot, but he, here's kind of how I think of this. There, there's a real similarity um, that Whole Foods and Amazon have in that, Whole Foods was struggling because all of these grocers were were carrying the same products that Whole Foods carries. A lot of them, not you know all of them, obviously, but they were carrying. Um, they were and they were starting their own brands to do all of these um, these same kind of organics. Um, you know, clean eating um, kind of products. And that was slowly siphoning off more of Whole Foods business. Um, Amazon had, um, uh, you know, its biggest threat. I mean, let's be honest. Amazon is such a, a monster right now in, in the U.S. last year in the holiday sales, which is when, you know, everybody makes all of their money in the fourth quarter. Amazon owned like 40 percent of the holiday, you know, gift market. The next closest um, competitor, I believe, was Best Buy in the low single yes. digits, like three to four percent. Right. So, but who um, wants to buy milk and eggs and bread online? I don't understand. 
Leo, it's not, um, it's not that, it's it's what they're gonna do. So so their threat, the biggest threat for Amazon was all of the the clicks, the, the brick and mortar, some of the bigger click and mortar ones, you know, getting smarter about online. They are getting smarter. Their well, digital transformation I efforts mean, are and, happening. But. Walmart is probably the biggest threat to Amazon, right? Walmart, oh, yeah. and, and vice versa. Walmart realizes- Amazon's the biggest threat to Walmart. Yeah, Walmart's Walmart, throwing yeah, a hissy yeah. fit right now. Tomato, tomato, Walmart's right? out here trying to do mafia style stuff. Oh, you shut at Walmart that you don't want to come over here. Like they're doing weird stuff. Yeah, they're to fight encouraging Amazon. their partners to to pull out of AWS and move to like Azure or something else. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, isn't that wild? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's Soprano Absolutely. stuff. Yeah. That's that's mafia. If you was to want to continue to do business with us, you probably would want to reconsider your relationship with Amazon. I'm not saying Wall nothing bad's going to happen, but you might not walk again. <laughs> Walmart flipped out when they saw this, right? Walmart flipped out. Yeah. All right. We haven't talked about Travis Kalanick yet. Uh, I got my shot glass ready to pour a little out. <laughs> really important, <laughs> Travis. Uber. Yeah, it seemed for a while there, every week there was a new Uber story. Just unbelievable story. Uh, groan after groan. Groan after groan. Uh, of course, the story this week. Travis Callan, a great story in the New York Times about how the board decided to fire after hours of drama. We are the board. Resistance is futile. <laughs> Mr. Kalanick's exit came under pressure after hours of drama involving Uber's investors, according to two people with knowledge of the situation. Uh, and, their, and their phone calls and hotel calls and Bill Gurley, who, by the way, uh, he was the venture partner at uh, Benchmark Capital, one of the big investors, has left Uber's board to put another partner on the board. Maybe he's somehow tarnished. But uh, Kalanick was in Chicago. Uh, a, a letter hand delivered to him says, Mr. Kalanick, time to say good night. Now, he's still going to be chairman of the board. He ain't going really anywhere, but he's not going to have day to day operational uh, management. Interestingly, a thousand Uber employees signed a petition saying we must have him back he's the only guy who can run uber but the investors clearly felt that he was more of a liability than an asset to the company your thoughts uh, uh yeah tom you start go ahead tom go ahead <laughs> you, you got the shot yeah. glass in hand i i i think this 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 is a a very difficult uh, situation for Uber to be in. They have no, virtually no C-level executives. They have a committee of 14 people running the company. Travis Kalanick was doing the things that he needed to do at this point. Now, you can rightly say too little too late as far as forgiving him personally, but he he was finally saying, "I yes, we're going to get rid of people. We're going to change the company culture. I mean, Ariana Huffington was right there next to him cheering him on, uh, saying, here's all the things you have to do. Uh, and and yet that faction of the board said, you know what? We'd just rather have you out of the way so we can pick an adult. And and what? maybe not that they didn't think the world of Travis or his abilities, but just that it was it was too much of a liability. And I and I think what is odd to me is that they didn't have a candidate already lined up. After that all is of this. interesting, right? We don't know yeah. who's taking his place. Yeah, and 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 that will be the telling tale here, right? If they were to get a Sheryl Sandberg, I don't think they'll get Sheryl Sandberg to leave Facebook. But if they were to get somebody like that, uh, that makes sense to me. If if they get someone unknown or or someone who doesn't have a proven track record, then that makes not a lot of sense at all. Yeah, and in fact, you're right. That would make what it would have made sense is to go out and talk to a Sheryl Sandberg or to. I'm sorry. Let me. Uh, I hate possible. autoplay video. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> let me or go out and talk to. Susan Wojcicki, she's been floated as an sure, CEO yeah. of YouTube. Yep. Maybe a guy, maybe somebody like Alan Mulally, another person whose been, name has been floated, former CEO of Ford, mm -hmm. who is currently, you know, just kind of hanging out, not doing anything, uh, and a smart guy. And if you if you think that uh, self-driving vehicles are important to Uber's future, might be a good choice. Wouldn't you go and talk to some of those people and say, look, we're gonna we're gonna boot Cal Kalanick? Yeah. Maybe because because uh, the reason you get rid of Colin, as far as like just brass text, if you're the board, I think you get rid of him, obviously not to please the employees because you've got a, a yeah. bit of an employee revolt going on, but because you want to polish it up for the IPO, you you don't want to have this yeah. in the way for the IPO and regulators. Yep, and you know I mean yeah. you got to consider government issues. I mean Uber has been fighting the government since day one, local government. 
they obviously considered him a toxic asset, you know, at, at, at this point. And, and so he, he had done a lot hit his obviously super aggressive. Um, he is, uh, um, the one that made Uber Uber and uh, for, for better and worse. And I, they had a lot of, st- they have a lot of stuff they need to clean up and clean their house. And I, they just decided that he wasn't the one to clean it up. Like he's the one who created the mess, having him clean it up, you know, probably doesn't work is essentially and with him what the owning, board decided. When he owns the majority of voting shares, the only way you convince him of this is to say, we need to bring in a caretaker CEO who's going to guide us through the IPO and make that really profitable for you, Travis. And so it's worth ideally, it to step aside. Ideally a woman, right? Because if you bring in a woman, then you can maybe get rid of that, shed that bro yeah. image. And then yeah. maybe you so, even say, yeah. Travis, we'll bring you back after the IPO a year or two later. Well, it seemed like we did tra- we did Travis Kalanick and Uber stories all year long. This was this was Uber's no good, very bad year all year long. Uh, Alex uh, Wilhelm, of course, is a regular. We love Alex. He's a great uh, journalist and a lot of fun. But the weirdest thing is he's living, or sometimes anyway, his girlfriend lives in my childhood home in Providence, Rhode Island. And from time to time, he's actually slept in my boyhood bedroom. And uh, the man without a country, Alex Wilhelm. True. He is uh, He's a bi-coastal. I now am bi coastal. There's yes. a rumor floating. Oh, you around. are. Yeah, I. Uh, I can say it, right? Yeah, I live in. Uh, I live in Leo's old house, ironically, in Providence, part of the time now. <laughs> I grew up the house I grew up in when I, I moved out of when I was like 15. He's living in my house. No way. My yeah. my girlfriend owns it. He's so. living in my mom and dad's bedroom. <laughs> it's, it's it's pretty Talk funny. Talk about confusing. I just got back a week ago. I'm so confused. <laughs> It's a great place. How did you guys figure out? How did you figure out it was his house? How did you make this connection? We, so his girlfriend was visiting, and uh, she mentioned that she grew up in Providence. Right. And I said, "Oh, I grew up in Providence, Providence, Rhode Island." And uh, she said, "Oh, where?" And it didn't take it took us about thirty seconds to figure out she was she owned my old house. It was. Oh I live God, on Street X. Funny. Oh my gosh, me too. I grew up in X. She number. said, "What house on Street X?" And I said, "There's twenty one." And she said, "That's my house." Yeah. Wow. I took pictures for you. <laughs> That's, by the way, that's when I knew we're in a simulation. That proved it. (laughs) That's the glitch in the matrix. I now know it's a simulation. Does that happen to you guys? It happens to you every once in a while. You know, oh, simulation. Nothing on that scale. That's pretty amazing. That's a glitch in the simulation. If if this is a simulation, I want to re-roll my character with better hair. Too late. Okay. <laughs> Part of the, well, you got to understand the rules of the simulation. The whole idea is that you have, you're, this is it. You rolled the character. You got to go from birth to death. This is it. There's no fixing. Do I get to try it again? Yeah, next time. You can roll a different character. But All right. you've decided to do a chaotic mage, and that's it. You're, you've got you to live with that. I don't even know if that's offensive or a compliment. I just, I'll just take it. Let's do it. The simulation is saving RAM. It's right untoward. They didn't have enough RAM to have more houses, it, and they thought, well, what is the chance of a collision? Oh, my God, we had a collision. There is somebody... There's some operator, some system, and going, oh, crap. Now I got to rewrite that code. Why did I give IBM this contract? Yeah. You should have put more <laughs> RAM in the damn thing. Uh, all right, Amy, we're going to put you on the spot. You have to represent all of womankind. Uh, although a number of men uh, jumped in on this. So apparently uh, there was a memo uh, placed by a Googler, I, as yet unnamed Googler, although if his name is ever revealed, I think <laughs> we'll find out about it. He posted it on a uh, apparently a Google ma- a meme site as well as um, uh, the internal equivalent of Google Plus, and the full uh, content of the memo has been finally revealed by Gizmodo. They they got it. wasn't probably very hard, and uh, I'm going to try to characterize this so that people can react to it. The reaction's been very very strong. You know, Google has had a diversity problem. The FTC has been trying to investigate them. Google said, no, you can't have any documents. Uh, Google says, we're satisfied that we're doing enough to hire more women and more uh, uh, minorities. Uh, It's apparent, though, if you look at the numbers, they're not. Women engineers represent one in five Googlers. Uh, African-Americans and Hispanics, even worse. I think it's one or two percent African-American engineers at Google's uh, uh, engineering division in the United States. Uh, but this um, this memo 
says, well, this is just uh, another form of discrimination. This all this uh, uh, diversity, um, all this attempt to. Let me see if I can find the uh, text of it. Um, it's pretty long. Yeah, I don't want to yeah. read yeah. it. Um, it. I can summarize. It, yeah, quickly. can you, Amy? Uh, go ahead. So, uh, so there are different sections of it, um, but the gist, the, the sort of gist of it is, women don't make good coders, according but, to the, the person okay. who wrote this, because uh, they're genetically just not suited. Right, genetically and socially not suited. Now they have other skills. He's saying, right? But women are extroverts, men are introverts. Right. So there, there's like a whole litany of women of like people, why. men like machines right. or things. Uh, this is so, like Larry Summers, the pre then president of Harvard, saying, "Well, women aren't good mathematicians. It's just genetically the case." So, Tell so that to Lovelace. Yeah, here, here's what I would say. Um, my, my viewpoint on this is possibly a little controversial. I don't think so, but but you know, I, I would say that we are not all the same. Um, that you know, women and men are not the same. But I would also say that within women, there's a quite a bit of diversity, just like there's quite a bit of diversity within men. The three of you sitting at that table are not, you know, archetypes or car carbon copies, no. right, of each other. At least I don't think so. Um, and, and by this guy's definition, you know, I, I, re I would read like a 16-year-old teenage boy if we agree with what he, you know, how he delineates the genders um, in, in the memo. So there's a couple of things going on. Um, one, I, I, you know, he's he's making broad generalizations about women and about men, which any sociologist would tell you don't, don't track. So his generalizations all, you know, and, and anybody who's a coder has taken math, right. which means that he, he should have known better than to generalize to begin with. He says, the so science the will back me up. The, the sociology proves that it doesn't, but it doesn't. So, it's, so that's point one is it's just wrong. One. Point two, um, this had to have been a pretty low level engineer um, because the way that he's describing some of the work would tell me that he hasn't yet worked on any more advanced projects at Google. He's probably like an entry level 23 year old kid. Um, nothing, nothing, you know, not that there's anything wrong with 23 year old kids, but what it does tell me is that, you know, he, his work has been binary. So he hasn't had to solve any real problems. Right. And anybody who's ever had to think about the future or about the past or solve any real problems understands that biodiversity is a good thing. Yes. Um, you know, and that teams teams are requisite. So to me, you know, this this was probably written by somebody in reaction to either a bad performance review or a bad day at work or, you know, feeling left out of the club or maybe he got rejected by a fellow coder uh, developer who happened to be a woman. You know, it could have been any of those things, but there's so much inexperience um, throughout the entire memo um, to me that, you know, it's it sounds like a petulant 20-year-old who's... Uh, you know, who, who doesn't have a lot of experience and doesn't know what he's talking about anyway. So I wasn't super angry or upset by the memo. Right. Now, what's been interesting is um, the reaction to that memo, which to me almost feels a little inauthentic. Um, it feels as though in the year 20, what was the year that movie P PCU came out? Do you guys remember that movie? It was like Mid early Jeremy Piven. It was quite some yeah. time ago. It was like 94, 95. I feel like we've circled, you know, all of history, cycles, you're right? right? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we, we've hit that cycle again where, um, our responses are expected. Um, and I feel like some of the responses that I've seen to this memo have almost been formulaic. What in, about in Google's response context. though? That's the one that really matters. And some people have been critical about the Google management's response to this, which was, we want to make a safe place at Google for all beliefs, including these beliefs. Which is why it would make me think of you. Was that a press release that they... Yeah, that was their official response to it. Right, um, right. They just hired a diversity uh, head. Yeah, she's literally been in the job two weeks and then this blows right. up. Right. So it's interesting you say what you said, uh, Amy, because I, I, before the show you mentioned you hadn't read Yonatan uh, Zunger's medium piece about this. No, you know, no, no, I, I had. You had, I okay. Yeah, yeah. So he yeah. was, uh, he's actually- and he said the same thing. A, a very, he said exactly the same thing. He's a very well-known yeah. uh, Googler, very politically active. 
Uh, he has recently left Google, so he said, well, I could speak a little more freely about this than I would have if I were still a manager at Google. And he said exactly the same thing. He yeah. said, when you first start coding, uh, you are just dealing with a machine. But as you get more senior, you realize, really, the job is not coding. The job is solving problems. Mm -hmm. And in particular, interacting with other people to solve those problems. It isn't it isn't, um, and I think you're right. I think a lot of young coders uh, starting off think what the, what coding is all about is learning how to instruct the machine. And he says, essentially, this is younger, uh, engineering is all about cooperation, collaboration, and empathy for both your colleagues and customers. Something that the, the memo writer uh, uh, said, oh, those are female traits. If someone told you engineering was a field where you could get away with not dealing with people or feelings, and I'm very sorry to tell you, you've been lied to. Solitary work is something that only happens at the most junior levels. And in fact, the traits which the manifesto described as female are the core traits which make someone successful at engineering. But, the, but I think the bigger issue, uh, Amy, is, is that the lack of diversity at Google and in Silicon Valley, right. does it hurt Google? Does it hurt the product? Well, I would say yes. Um, and I, I would say, you know, I one of the things that I'm researching most intently is artificial intelligence. So that's been a big part of my life um, for the past couple of years. And you can see um, the strange and weird ways that AI is starting to break um, or break down. Uh, and that's a that's that's you know, a result of having too few people with too narrow a worldview um, trying to solve problems together. So, you know, everybody that, that I know that works in tech likes to talk incessantly about nature, and yet they seem to not take some very basic cues from nature. Um, nature tells us, you know, uh, that biodiversity is good for, for the ecosystem. Um, and it's always good to introduce you know, complementary um, species and life forms, you know, to be together. What I find so interesting is that um, we see, you know, study after study and anecdotally and just evidence all around the biodiversity is great. And yet we, we don't seem to take that advice when it comes to staffing um, the, the, uh, the offices, and, you know, where, where the stuff is being built. Right. Now, you know, you know, it's it's difficult, and and I, it's hard to have this conversation without using those broad generalizations. Right. Um, well, that's you know, so. But, I want you to school me because, and I'm gonna I'm gonna walk right into a minefield here. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, I want to be educated here. It is true that I mean, and of course, every individual is a unique individual, and many guys have more female traits, many women have more male traits, whatever. Uh, my wife is much butcher than I am, but you, it seems to me there are, gen, are there gender differences? Well, I think it depends on who you ask, right? Um, I think Dinesh D'Souza, who's a, you know, right wing conservative writer would tell you that stereotypes are born out of fact and that they exist for a reason. I think that any sociologist who's had any real training would tell you that it depends on the data set. And gender is not just influenced biologically, but also by right. the cultural norms and standards in each country right. and region and everything else. And yeah, um, when so I, I had, you have kids, right? Yeah, I have a kid, yeah. Yeah, okay, well, we have a boy and a girl. And uh, I'm pretty convinced that we did not in any way try to push them in any direction, but the, the boy liked uh, playing with, you know, guns and yeah. balls, and the girl did not. Right. There, and this was out of the womb. This was very early on. I don't think this was so socialization. So I agree. I, there's a massive debate over nature versus nurture. And I don't, right. and it's very hard to know what's nature and what's nurture. I guess, look, I don't, I, I think we do need diversity. It's clearly we need diversity in Silicon Valley and everywhere. Everywhere is, every workplace is better if, there's, if it's a diverse workplace, it's just better for everything, for everybody mm -hmm. in the workplace. I know that. That's true. Uh, but part of the reason that's true is because every because people bring different flavors to it. And I think you, I don't think it's unreasonable to observe that women bring different flavors than men. Or is that is that really a bad thing to look at? 
Here's what here's what I would say. Um, humans are not wired for change. We are, you know, our limbic systems react very poorly when the status quo is challenged. That puts us into fight or flight mode, you know, and it and it causes us to make bad decisions. And more importantly, it causes us to pine for the way that things used to be. And it's because of our limbic systems that, you know, a lot of people are not good at thinking about the future. However, if we look from a statistical standpoint, um, you know, what it, that that change is often better, right? And that it helps us approach and understand the future in a, in a better way. What's happening right now is that technology has you know, reach a certain inflection point. We have enough people uh, who are trained that can go into the field. We have enough compute power um, to be able to work on meaningful projects. And, um, you know, because of how things have always been, um, those roles are predominantly um, dominated by white males and males from other, you know, a few other countries. So, this is really about change, um, and it happens through every field. If you you know if you look throughout time, it's happened in every field and in every case. And once that change happens, and and the workforce has become more diversified, you know they tend to be more productive. They do better. There's all this data showing that. So I think when it comes down to it, we're just dealing with the latest um, the latest round of this, and we feel it and sense it acutely because it's the field that we all pay attention, that us, the people who are on this show and who are listening to this show, watching it, um, you know, it's it feels acute because we pay attention to it, but it's the same story that's been written over and over again, you know, in law and in academia and, you know, in all of these other different fields and industries. One of the transitions that happened this year, uh, and it, it particularly uh, affected us, of course, was the loss of the great science fiction author and regular contributor to twit jerry pornell and i just you know i asked the team it happened a, a few days before the episode can you put something together and i'm just so grateful uh to it was victor bognot uh, karsten bondi made some suggestions uh i made some suggestions and they just did a beautiful job we thought boy we can't end the year without a revisit to our tribute to our great jerry pornell watch Our guest today is somebody that I have, I've been a fan of literally for years, ever since his column in Byte magazine, and he certainly influenced my career. Let's welcome Jerry Pornell. A lot of people couldn't figure out why in the world was I better known than anybody else in the computer business except maybe Dvorak. I wrote the Field and Stream column. Me and Joe went hunting. Well, me and old Zeke went computing, and that was the great secret I never told anybody. A great many, if not most, scientists were heavily influenced by sci-fi and focused their research on areas that science fiction inspired them to study, which is why, in so many ways, modern scientific advances parallel what you guys are writing about. When you get around to listening to the moat in God's eye, pay attention to the pocket computer. I wrote that in 1972, and an iPhone does most of what it says in there. But of course, we had to set it a long way away because even in, in 1972, nobody thought that I would live to see. Isn't it amazing? Most of the people in this world accept fruits of technology in about the same way as a kitten accepts milk when you pour it into a bowl for it. There was a common phrase in the robot industry, you never understand how smart a moron is until you try to program a robot. <laughs> it towards the end of the Soviet Union and Panovich, which was doing the handwriting recognition software for Microsoft. He said, my biggest problem is I don't have enough technical handwriting. Then I got my logbook out, you know, that's the technical handwriting that was the standard and that engine has been in every wow. edition of a microsoft handwriting recognition program since 1990. how is and your handwriting jerry are you it's god awful <laughs> okay great it's really terrible x projects are this go out to some place like edwards or some awful place where nobody wants to be go out there and you tell them i want you to build the best whatever it is you can build with technology as of this afternoon. You build three copies of it. We test one to the edge of it and we probably prang it. With the second one, we fly because we learned from the first until we get all the information out of it. And the third one ends up in the Smithsonian. 
<laughs> yeah, Jerry's the wordy one. Yes. I, Larry has told a perfectly good story. It would be publishable now. But when I'm finished with it, it will be probably half again, maybe twice as long. And then he goes over it and finds some scene that what everybody will remember, and they'll forget that I ever had any part in it. <laughs> what the hell? I've always been an operations research guy, you know. I, that's a guy who knows less and less about more and more <laughs> until he knows nothing at all about everything. <laughs> One last question. You ever going to write your memoir? Maybe, although in a sense I'm writing it now, aren't I? Maybe after a year or two we'd have the whole thing. No, maybe take a little longer than that. How yeah. many people do you know whose personal computer has been <laughs> on display in the Smithsonian? You're the only one I know of. Yeah, probably all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I know all of them. <laughs> the great Dr. Jerry Pornell. Uh, it was an honor to consider him a friend. We'll miss him. Thank you, Jerry. And Godspeed. Edget 22 made an amazing discovery. Oh, my she, gosh. <laughs> she looked at Kentucky Fried Chicken's official Twitter account, at KFC, and noticed it followed exactly 11 mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Five Spice Girls and six guys named Herb. Oh, my gosh. 11 <laughs> herbs and spices. This probably is the most viral tweet of the last five years. The Spice Girls would pronounce it herbs. That's true. Herbs. That's true. I've got 11 herbs and spices. That is Gopa. amazing. Is that is that the social kudos to the social media director? It's a Louisville company. Good job, Yum Brands. Actually, I, I I know their social media director, so I'm going <laughs> to ask about that because that's incredible. Find out if he's the guy. That would be a great story. Is yeah. he the guy who thought it's, of this? It's a it's a lady. It's one. It's a okay. It's an it's, Easter egg though, right? Yeah. You do this yeah. and you don't tell oh, anybody. Amazing. And you you wait. wait for somebody to notice it. But you said social media director, which is the right thing. People were like, oh, my gosh, that social media intern is so great. And then people that work in social media were like, not the intern. That takes actual thought, planning, yeah. execution. Yeah. Don't diminish the value of the work that just went viral and brought KFC, not just most attention on social media, but right here. I'm now saying KFC, which I don't say ever, but good for them. <laughs> You'd have to, and actually, Edgette's pretty smart because this is the f people that the KFC is following. You'd have to kind of... Say Jerry Horn. Oh, that's Jerry Halliwell. That was the Spice Girl. Wait mm -hmm. a minute. Official Mel B. She was a Spice Girl. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. One, two, three, four, five, six Spice, five Spice Girls. Who are the her herbs? And then Herb Scribner, Herb Wesson, Herb Waters, <laughs> Herb Dean. Council. Random oh. herbs. Oh. And, Herb, and Herb Appert. All verified Herb herbs. He's a great trumpet player, actually. Yeah. Oh, they are all they blue checks. All verified herbs. Oh, they all they did all verified accounts, all, too. All verified How herbs elitist. and spices. Well, nah. you want to look legitimate, right? You can't just follow. Because milkshake duck, your herb can become, have you ever seen that thing? <laughs> oh, so milkshake duck is a, is a meme. It says, like, oh, look, we all love milkshake duck. And then five minutes go by, we're sorry to inform you that milkshake duck is racist. Whenever the internet finds something that's lovely and nice, it turns out to be bad. So if you found a herb that was non-verified, he may become milkshake duck and actually racist, and KFC has to apologize, uh... thus ruining the moment. So by following verified accounts, there's probably a lower level of that happening. Yes. Anyway, social media is hard, and that was hilarious. <laughs> social media is hard. Yeah. Uh, kudos to anyone who has to manage social media. I can't even manage my own. You're pretty good on Twitter. So, <laughs> Milkshake Duck in the Urban Dictionary is defined as a person who rapidly becomes famous for something wholesome before they're revealed as a deeply flawed character with terrible opinions and or a shady past. Welcome to humanity. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember Ken yeah. Bone? Remember Ken Bone? Yes. Ken Bone. Yes. Ken Bone. And then Sweater all, boy from uh, the, uh, from and the then debates. All his adult video habits from Reddit were found out. Oh, poor Ken Bone. Yep, exactly. Don't become famous. Just don't do it. Incognito yeah. mode. Yeah. Just don't leave comments on Reddit on porn under your own name. Incognito mode. Well, the good news for Apple is <laughs> we have a <laughs> number of data points. Um, of course, Apple's own quarterly results came out uh, the day before the iPhone X uh, shipped. Uh, and they say they had amazing sales of uh, iPhones. Um, uh, the iPhone... Uh, sold 46 points million 46.6 million units in the fourth quarter much of those probably iphone 8s uh, so iphone 8 was a success and then of course slice uh which is an interesting uh story i don't know i'd love to hear whether you guys trust it or not i i use slice slice is an app that monitors your um 
uh, Gmail to see uh, of its customers, and there are, I guess, millions of users, monitors Gmail to see if uh, uh, your delivery is coming and when it's coming. So they have advanced information, uh, admittedly a, sm a sample, but a, I think a fairly large sample size. And they say, according to you know their customers, their users, it's the largest product launch in the company's history. This is the graph, the iPhone 8 and 8 Plus, kind of one of the smallest product launches in the company history. Uh, but the iPhone 10 even bested the iPhone 6, which was huge because it was the first big iPhone. This, you know, this is pretty significant. Do you, Brian, are those useful numbers, you think? Are these, I feel like Slice is, use, is useful. Um, you know, I haven't been an Apple reporter in several years, so I really don't remember. But is, is, are they scanning receipts or something in yeah. emails? Is that how it yeah, works? Yeah, that's how it works. Um, I, I think Apple has disputed those metrics before, like just from what I remember, they don't love them. And I'm not sure if it's because they're too accurate or if, if they're totally wildly off. Um, but I do think that early orders are definitely a good metric for, you know, uh, early adopter interest and just, you know, like an indicator of uh, whether or not a product is very interesting to technology enthusiasts. You know, I don't I don't know if it really tells us much about the long term sure. over the course of a year. Sure. But it definitely is interesting to see the iPhone 10 and so much excitement over it. Yeah. Well, I uh, I think uh, three out of the four of us have one in our hands. Ed Bot is uh, still using his Nokia 1050. Uh, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm teasing. But uh, uh I, I, I wanted to hate this phone. I went for the price, for the attention it was getting. I just wanted to hate this phone. I wanted to find something wrong with it, and I can't find anything wrong with it. Uh, so, but, so do you use an emoji? I have sent some. That is not going to be a killer uh, feature. I don't think. <laughs> I've sent a few, and of course, our friend Harry you know, McCracken claims to have invented something that is really going to end the world sooner, which is an emoji karaoke. I don't know if he was he the first one to do it. He claims so, to he claims to have, to have invented first... it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. But I'll I'll play a little bit for you if in case you somehow have have missed the excitement of an emoji karaoke. It's actually kind of a hard thing to do because what you have to do is record using the screen recorder because you're limited to um, ten seconds. No, this is an ad. Let's let's see if I can find it. I, I think that Renee has an actual how-to on the iMore site of how to do this yes. yourself. If yes. you so wish to torture the rest of the world with an ad emoji. Uh, and maybe Renee's found a better way to do it, but what I was told is that you have to use the screen recorder and then edit out, crop out the UI stuff. And then you can, um, according to BuzzFeed, Harry McCracken invented it. So, and then you can, and then you can mix it into a, uh, here's Harry's first, or one of his first. So he's got a rabbit and a chicken singing. Oh, that's good though. That is good. Singing Blue Swedes, Hooked on a Feeling. Now, I just want to remind ASCAP BMI that this is in use, uh, in service of news and commentary. <laughs> Not being used for any aesthetic value. Although I think it's pretty funny. So how does Renee's technique? Does it? Because does he have to? You have to use a screen recorder and all of that. Yeah, I think he's doing also. Yeah. Yeah. Here's another one from Harry. This is the first one. <laughs> it's Bugs Bunny and Elmer Fudd. There doesn't apparently. Uh, Exist an Elmer Fudd an emoji. It's kind of a limited. Actually, there's some uh, concern about. Believe it or not, I found I managed to find uh, all the negatives. There's a <laughs> there's some concern about this because Apple, uh, of course, Apple says the uh, the Face ID information is stored in the secure enclave is not available to anybody else. We don't see it. Only the phone sees it, and it does a very good job of recognizing you. I'm actually pretty impressed with Face ID. I, I wasn't, you know, I'm, it's, it's as, as good as it could be, I would think, in the circumstances. But there's some concern because there is an API for third-party developers to use the cameras in the notch. Uh, I imagine Snapchat would be one of the first, right? Wouldn't that be a great way to use uh, this, get those Snapchat uh, characters, uh, use the notch and do a better job of it? And so, and there's nothing to stop them from X, X, filtrating that information from the phone to the Snapchat servers. All the information delivered by the, the notch. 
So there's some. So you concern. choose to say yes or no. You have to approve to it. an application. So yes. you would approve it if you feel comfortable with them, maybe knowing how you feel when you look at and their app. Yeah, I think that's fair. And the ACLU and the Center for Democracy and Technology say, well, maybe this is a problem. I don't know. I, I'm, you have to really stretch. To <laughs> You're right. You're right. You have you have, you have to approve it. They ACLU says uh, a lot of things about Face ID. They don't like it. Uh, but something to be aware of. Uh, senior policy analyst uh, at the ACLU says, uh, you know, a bad guy could, you know, what? Get your face. Big deal. <laughs> All right. I'm trying to find negatives. I really am. It's not easy. <laughs> It's interesting because face ID misses me when I'm grumpy. Like if I have a grumpy oh, face, yeah. it will miss me. Now, and if my hair is in my face, it'll miss you me. You have a choice of uh, having it require that you're paying attention, looking at the phone or not. I would imagine it's a little easier if you don't turn that on. I've left mine on so somebody can't sneak up behind you. and I don't care about that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> And grab your phone and then have to try to unlock yeah. it, not just steal the and phone. And all you would have to do is go... <laughs> I'm grumpy. All I have to do is be grumpy. That's it. Which I probably would look shocked if someone, you know, smashed my, I'd, like that would probably be enough to stop I have some anecdotal <laughs> evidence that it me. does get better. Apple said it would get better uh, because right. uh, occasionally it doesn't recognize me. Uh, when I was, I, I did it first with glasses, but I didn't have glasses. It didn't, I entered the code, the, uh, so then you have to use your pin. But from then on, it recognized me with glasses. So I have a feeling it's updating all the time. Yes. And, and, I, and mm -hmm. Apple said it would be, and I think there is evidence it's doing it. Same thing, the studio lighting confused it at first, not anymore. It gets better. Uh, it's pretty yeah, impressive. There was it's, a, it's, to the, a, it's to the point a, where... A brother... Go ahead. A brother, you know, did the exact same thing. So they had similar faces and right, two brothers um, unlocked the phone by, you know, having the phone relearn the new face, which was actually the brother's face, which was similar enough for the phone to be mixed up. So there's probably you know, some updates that will make it a little bit more um, attuned to that, but it is constantly trying to relearn. Like if I probably do the passcode with a grumpy face, it would probably yeah, notice grumpy exactly. Georgia. It doesn't, so when it doesn't recognize you, it asks for the passcode, you enter it and I, I suspect it's then it's saying, oh, well, that was you, I guess. We'll add grumpy to your repertoire. Uh, we did try it with identical twins. Megan Maroney, one of my co-hosts, uh, tried her iPhone 10. She had one of her son's huck uh, unlock it with his face and then gave it to Milo. Milo was able to unlock it. This is what Apple said could happen with identical twins and they were right. So that's a drawback. You can only have one face in there. Unlike the fingerprint, I used to let my wife have her fingerprint on there so she could get to my phone when she needed to. Now it's, I can, you know, I, sh I have to give her the passcode. Uh, I fix it, ran to Australia as they are wont to do to get an iPhone uh, 10 so they could destroy it. We had uh, Kelsey from uh, iFixit on the new screensavers yesterday. A couple of surprise, interest, not surprises, but interesting things. A, they gave it a repairability score of six, which is not bad. Mm. Uh, better almost than I thought. They found the batteries in two modules. It's an L-shaped battery with two different modules. And as a result, the logic board has an odd shape and is jam-packed. They figured out it has three gigs of RAM. Apple never talks about that, but that seems more than adequate. Of course, it has the A11 Bionic, as we expected. It actually has quite a few custom processors on it, which is uh, kind of interesting. It's It's got a lot of smarts in here. There's the, uh, the you know, they give the chip numbers, but there's uh, definitely a motion coprocessor uh, in there and uh, some other things. It's a, for such a tiny logic board, there's a lot of stuff in there. All right. I don't know what else to say. That's the iPhone 10. Jeff Bezos, by the way, now officially, for once and for all, the richest man in the world. Hundred. You got to show the picture, dude. There it is. Yeah. yeah. This has become uh, a meme. The Actually, Basinator. Yeah. He's buff. But then, of course, it was an internet meme, and there's all sorts of other uh, images of him walking down, looking by. Is this at the Allen? Uh, this might have been at the uh, Allen Co. meetings. Uh, they put the rock behind him. You know, also looking buff. Let me see if I can find that because Bezos did an interview uh, this week with his brother, uh, and his brother and he. There you go. There's the there's the picture with the Rock and who's that other guy? That's uh, Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel. Yeah. Come on, Leo. Bad in the bad in the furious. Yeah. Um, 
And so they were, they actually, his brother f uh, put that up on the uh, screen and uh, they were laughing. They were laughing. His brother, though, if you look at his Jeff Spazos, his brother, he be, he's been ha hanging out of the gym. Well, let's see if I can find a picture of this. <laughs> um, so he got his brother, as one would expect, got him to reveal a lot about himself. For instance, uh, every summer from the time he was about six to the time he was about 17, Bezos would stop it. Autoplay video. I, I got to. He would um, he would uh, go to his grandpa's pop. He called him, where there was nothing. There was there there was no connectivity. Bezos spent his summers working on his grandfather's ranch in South Texas. He says, "I learned my resourcefulness from uh, my grandfather." He tells some stories like the time his grandfather. Leapt, I don't know if I can tell this, do this story justice. Leapt out of the, uh, he's driving the pickup truck off the ranch. He leapt out of the pickup truck. I've done this. Who doesn't? Trying to <laughs> open the gate without stopping the truck so he can open the gate, jump in the truck and keep going. Accidentally, wow. the truck runs into his hand, his thumb, and cuts off most of the top of his thumb. Uh, they rush to the hospital and, and Pop, Jeff's grandfather, says, he, he's so mad. He says the thumb was hanging by a thread. He's so mad he takes the thumb rips it off, throws it into the bushes, <laughs> goes to the hospital and says, I don't want my thumb reattached. Just take some skin from my butt and put it over the hole. <laughs> and ever after, Bezos is telling the story, he'd have butt hair growing off his thumb that he had to, sh when he shaved, he would shave his thumb. And now you know how he's the richest man in the world. I, th I don't think the dots quite connect on that story. <laughs> well, the point Jeff was trying to make is I learned resourcefulness from yeah. my grandfather. He spent, he bought a non-working combine. This is not Jeff. Jeff doesn't have the butt thumb. His grandpa has a butt thumb. <laughs> he bought a non-working combine and said, Jeff, your job, he's like, Jeff is like 12, is to get that thing working. And they got, they ordered parts and Jeff worked on, they, some of the parts were so big, they couldn't lift them. So grandpa built a crane, a homemade crane, so they could lift the parts into the combine. He said, he said, it's this is where I learned how you invent your way out of the box. He says, choosing his wife, same thing. He, uh, <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> should I stop? Uh, yeah, I don't know. He, uh, he says, I was looking, for, he was doing the Dayton thing, like he had the app. He was doing the Dayton thing. And he said, I just want to find a woman who's resourceful. So that, what was it? So that if I hurt myself, she can, I, what was, I got, I want to find this. It's just the funniest. If you get a chance, just read the interview. <laughs> I guess that's, that's the bottom line. And I'm not making up the story about the uh, thumb. <sighs> yeah, the moral of that story is throw away the thing that you really need when you're mad at it. <laughs> and cover it with butt hair. Or butt hair. As a kid what? in Montessori school, Bezos describes how teachers would have to physically move his chair from one task. You know, at Montessori works. By the way, there's his brother who lifts even more than Jeff. Look at that. Uh, he was in Montessori school. You go from task station to task station. Jeff would get so focused that they had to actually pick up his chair and move, and move it. <laughs> He's not a fan of checking his phone at the dinner table. He's not big on multitasking. Even when it comes to his email, multitasking bothers me. If I'm reading my email, I just want to really be reading my email. Kids, that's how you become the richest man in the world. Hundred. Honestly, multitasking dollars. is mostly a crock, right? It like, is. You can't focus, really do focusing it. Focusing is better. No, yeah. you can't really do it. <laughs> Grandpa's hairy thumb. You know, I, one of the things I take pride in on Twit and uh, is the titles, right? Ever since we started Twit six hundred some episodes ago, what is it, six forty three? Uh, I've always tried to have interesting, compelling titles. Maybe not the best SEO. Maybe not a title that makes you, you know, have to listen, but just something fun. And I like to kind of make it almost an Easter egg. So as you're, it's, it's always something in the show that somebody says, and it always has to do with something we're talking about. That particular story from Jeff Bezos gave us one of my favorite titles of the year, Grandpa's Hairy Thumb. I, 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 love, I love that. And I want to shout out to the chat room because in a way at the end of our shows, it's always a competition uh, the chat room is, you know, firing off titles, ideas, and very often, uh, in fact, almost always, the title ID comes with the chat room. So thank you, chat room. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. I, I'm so grateful that I get to do this show every Sunday. 
uh, some of my favorite journalists. We don't have a regular panel on this show because it's a chance for me to talk to all sorts of people. And I think, I hope you enjoy that. Um, let us know, you know, keep watching is the best way to do it. And, and we, we will make, I promise you, some great shows for uh, 2018. Have a happy new year and safe new year. We want you back next year. We'll be back here doing Twit January 7th, a whole new episode, lots of fresh ideas, and, of course, all the tech news. In fact, that'll be our CES edition. We'll see you then. I'm Leo Laporte. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Happy New Year. Another Twit. This is amazing.